Okay. We'll get started now with part one of our monitoring policy and innovation session. Thanks so much everyone for joining us. I'm excited to introduce your moderator for this session, Jenna, who is our invasive species policy coordinator. She's one of our experts in invasive species policy here. She also tackles a lot of our Don't Let It Loose campaigns and projects related to the organisms and trade pathway. Thanks so much, Jenna. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> so close to getting going perfectly. <laughs> Thanks so much for, uh, for having me. Um, and yeah, welcome everybody to uh, the first um, of two sessions on monitoring innovation uh, policy. And so I'm going to start us off with a little treat to wake everybody up. Um, in light of Valentine's Day, I have some invasive species themed uh, Valentine's for you and yours. Oak, wilt you be mine? Um, that's a question no, a lot of people are going to be asking today. Um, we also have, you have my heart in a Japanese knotweed. Um, you red-eared slid into my heart. And finally, you have a heart of gold. So keep those in mind today. Uh, and happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Um, I'm going to just get off of my share screen now <laughs> and pass it along to uh, our first speaker, who is Matt Smith. Uh, he is a bio biodiversity and invasive species biologist with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. And it, just as a reminder to everybody, you know the drill, uh, place the questions in the Q&A function, not the chat function. Um, and yeah, we'll get going right now. All yours, Matt. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, can you just confirm that you're seeing my screen here? Uh, yep. But we can see it. Uh, it's in currently in uh, presenter function right now. Presenter mode. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. One second. No worries. Okay, are you seeing the presentation now? Uh, no, just currently uh, a Windows screen, actually. <laughs> okay, how about now? Uh, no, sorry, yeah, it's just in uh, PowerPoint still for some reason. And now? Uh, nope, still seeing the PowerPoint. I don't know um, if, uh, yeah, maybe that top top present button could work. I really don't. So <laughs> I'm going to hey. stop sharing and start again because I'm not sure what's going on here. Sure. Yeah. Maddie, do you have any uh, recommendations there? Yeah, I was just going to say where you're now, where you are now is great. Um, on the very top there, you're at the home tab. If you go over to the slideshow tab, you should be able to see a button to share to start the slideshow. At the at here? Just along that top bar, I think, uh, the orange bar little slide button. Is that what you're referring to, Manny? Yeah. There might even be a little button in the very bottom. My screen's a little obstructed right now, but there's a little button on the bottom.
Perfect. Now we can see you. Now you can see it. Oh, goodness. Yeah, looks well, great. <laughs> the first six minutes out of my presentation. So, I'll to go quick. All right. Um, thank you. So, yeah, thanks very much for uh, for both hosting the event as well as uh, my, myself today. Um, when I was considering what I was going to talk about today, uh, I I couldn't help but to think back to where we started in 2018, uh, the first year that this event was run. And it was just a group of colleagues and partners uh, sitting around uh, but, you know, attempting to, to grow this to what it is now. Uh, but you know, six or seven years later, uh, it's grown to, we were just chatting about the numbers, almost a thousand people have uh, attended at least at some point uh, during this, this last three days. So it's really quite impressive. And you know, over that last six years, the world has changed a lot. COVID-19 has really changed the way that we think about uh, work and how we communicate. In the virtual conference in 2018, probably would have seemed like something that only tech companies like Apple or Google might do. Uh, but now in a short period of evolution, it's really become very common practice. And yeah, you can see the advantages of that as we connect with uh, all of these people from across Canada, uh, from across the province, and even internationally. And it uh, truly allows us to connect, uh, share uh, our knowledge, and look for solutions to work together. Uh, so I'm really proud of how far we've come. Um, and today I'm going to be providing an update, uh, uh, providing an update on recent changes that we've made uh, to the regulations under the Invasive Species Act, uh, as well as updates to Ontario's Invasive Species Strategic Plan. Uh, so as a background, I want to provide an overview of Ontario's Invasive Species Program. Uh, our aim uh, generally is uh, to minimize the, uh, inv the impacts of invasive species posed to Ontario. Over the past three days, we've heard a variety of stories and presentations about impacts invasive species are causing. And broadly, we consider these under three main values, the environment, the economy, and society as a whole. Uh, the infographic on the screen attempts to quickly outline uh, these impacts, such as biodiversity loss, native species decline, impacts to businesses and infrastructure, uh, and even on our uh, well-being and our way of life as society. I can't imagine there's a single person that has not been impacted by invasive species in some way. Our role in managing invasive species recognizes that we cannot do this alone. Effective management of invasive species requires collaboration across all levels of government, with partners, with people, with businesses. It really requires a whole of society approach to prevent, uh, detect, respond to, and manage invasive species. And to achieve these goals, we use a variety of tools uh, as listed on the right side of my, my slide. Policy and response involves taking action to uh, reduce the impacts uh, of high-risk invasive species. And we use a risk-based approach to identify high-risk species and where appropriate, we take action such as developing and implementing regulations or engaging in control activities. Oops. Yeah, investing in research and monitoring ensures that we continue to develop and refine uh, techniques to monitor, understand, and manage invasive species. Jurisdictional collaboration helps to increase efficiencies in our work and recognizes that uh, we, we need to consider the management of invasive species beyond political boundaries. Uh, which we know invasive species uh, do not heed. Finally, implementing and supporting education and outreach initiatives is a critical component uh, to inform the public about beneficial actions they can take through BMPs, uh, regulations and rules that they need to follow, and encouraging participation in citizen science programs, uh, which enhances our ability to detect invasive species early as well as uh, understand their distribution. So the next few slides, I'm going to cover uh, the recent changes that were made under Ontario's Invasive Species Act. Uh, just but prior to getting into those changes, I'm going to provide an overview of the act itself, uh, especially for those that may not be familiar with it. Uh, the ISA came into force in November of 2016. Uh, it was the first subnational legislation in Canada to be created for the sole purpose of uh, managing invasive species. The Act itself is an enabling framework, and it provides the tools to uh, address invasive species, such as the ability to regulate invasive species and carriers, enhance detection, inspection, and enforcement authorities, uh, and support for control and eradication. 
The act is science-based and species regulated under the act are those which present uh, or pose a risk to Ontario's natural environment. This is determined through a risk assessment process and that risk assessment process considers the species ability to arrive, survive, uh, spread and cause impacts. When considering a species for regulation, we also consider the effectiveness that a regulation uh, would have or may have in uh, preventing the introduction or spread of invasive species. And thereby that focuses our efforts on uh, prevention where regulations have the most uh, or the greatest impact. There are two classifications for how we regulate species under the Act. We have uh, prohibited invasive species and restricted invasive species. Generally speaking, prohibited invasive species are those species that are not established in Ontario uh, or are established in Ontario, but in a very limited or local um, distribution. Uh, and so we've heard about some of these examples already, uh, such as the marble crayfish, water soldier, and European water chestnut are all regulated as prohibited invasive species. Uh, so prohibited invasive species uh, have this full suite of regulations applied. Uh, so that includes importation, possession, transportation, uh, depositing, releasing, propagating, and then trade activity like buying, selling, uh, or leasing. Restricted invasive species, uh, generally speaking, are those we regulate uh, species as restricted for those species that might be established in Ontario and are widespread. And the main difference between the two classifications is that restricted invasive species only have uh, two prohibitions that are automatically applied, and that is bringing them into provincial parks and conservation reserves or uh, depositing or releasing. Additional prohibitions can be added uh, through regulation, and it allows us to pick and choose those prohibitions that might be the most appropriate for the species itself. And one of the main reasons that we do this is because we don't want to inadvertently create a barrier to the management of that species uh, through the regulation itself. Uh, so getting into the, the recent updates, uh, the next three slides are going to present the uh, species that have been recently added or regulated under the Invasive Species Act. Uh, I'm not going to go into any great detail on the details of the species. If you're interested in learning more, uh, you can certainly uh, view resources online. We will have a, an invasive species profile for each one of these species on our website shortly. Uh, but so this first uh, uh, slide goes over the uh, animals that have been added. So we have uh, four species of fish, the eyed eastern and western mosquito fish and red shiner. We have two genre or genuses of uh, crayfish that have been added. Uh, so that is Procumbaris and Pathophasticus. Uh, just to note, we did have two species uh, within the Procumbaris uh, genus regulated previously. That is the marble crayfish. And the red swamp crayfish, so nothing changes there. We just added the rest of the, the genus. And uh, one additional mammal, the nutria. Uh, and so these are all regulated as prohibited invasive species. Uh, the next two slides are going to uh, cover the plants that have been added to the invasive species list. Uh, so that is oxygen weed, all species in the genus Salvinia. Eurasian water milfoil and all species in the Alzola uh, genus. Um, oxygen weed and uh, Salvinia are regulated as prohibited, uh, and uh, the following, uh, the remaining species plants are regulated as restricted invasive species. And the remaining there are floating primrose willow, flowering rush, and tree of heaven. And then finally, this slide, uh, it, busy at me, as it may be, uh, it covers all of the regulations or all of the species that are regulated under the Invasive Species Act. Uh, so that includes uh, aquatic plants, fish, aquatic inverts, terrestrial plants, mammals, one insect, uh, and uh, crayfish as well. And those that are bolded or uh, highlighted in bold are those uh, that I just covered that were just recently added in 2024. And finally, uh, last but not least on the ISA, I just wanted to uh, highlight uh, the only carrier regulation we have under the Act. Um, so that applies to watercraft and watercraft equipment. Uh, so this, in, this came into force in 2022. Uh, so we're a couple of years in now, uh, but um, generally speaking, it's, uh, 
the goal of this regulation is to stop or slow the, the movement of invasive species that uh, might be moved uh, through the boating recreational boating pathway. And so the regulation requires boaters to take action uh, in two different ways. So one, we think about it when they're leaving the lake. Um, and so when a boat is taken out of the water and before transporting that boat over land, the boater must remove uh, or open the drain plugs to allow the water to drain from the boat and take reasonable precautions to remove all plants, animals, and uh, organisms from the boat before transporting. Uh, then prior to returning to any water body, uh, the regulation requires that boat to be completely free of any aquatic organisms. Uh, so we thought of it in two different ways that we really structured this way to allow a boater to leave the water, do their best at the launch site where they may not have equipment to clean the boat, and then go to uh, their storage facility or home where they may have uh, better equipment to form a, a full decontamination. Okay, so my next few slides, and I, I realize I'm probably getting out of time here because I was uh, delayed, uh, but I'm going to cover some updates we're making to Ontario's invasive species strategic plan. Uh, so the strategic plan uh, was released in 2012, and the policy outlines the government's commitments and strategic direction to address invasive species in the province. Last year, and so in 2023, we conducted a review of progress on the plan, and we've published those results. The review highlights a variety of significant milestones and achievements uh, in invasive species management and prevention across the province over the past decade. Given the cross-cutting nature of invasive species prevention and management, the review isn't just scoped to, to us, to government actions, uh, but it provides a full picture of activities that have been taken by government and non-government organizations across the province. Uh, and this is just a quick clipping from uh, the review itself. Uh, I'm not going to read through this full timeline, but if you're interested, I'd encourage you to find the, the review online. Um, and it's really quite impressive to see all the success and progress uh, that has been made uh, and that we have compiled into the review. Uh, for example, and as I've already mentioned, the ISA was passed, and that was really helped to address important policy gaps that existed in the management framework. Um, advances in science and technology, such as eDNA, uh, have provided new tools for uh, us to detect uh, invasive species. And strong partnerships have been formed. Uh, between government and non-government organizations. And these, these partnerships support uh, strong management and control of species on the ground. In addition to, the, uh, to our analysis, we also found that invasive species continue to be an issue. Uh, surprise, surprise, that's probably not a uh, groundbreaking thing for me to be telling you. Um, the review also outlines some outstanding gaps uh, and challenges as well as opportunities for uh, future programs. And that brings me to this. So while the review was looking back over the last decade, we are building upon what we've learned at, and looking forward through a renewed OISA. The renewal will provide updated provincial direction and commitments uh, to guide invasive species management. We're still in the early processes of this review, uh, uh, sorry, renewal. Uh, and some of you may have seen this initiative on the ERO. Uh, near the end of 2023, we started our early engagement process by posting that, uh, a proposal to seek feedback, uh, and that feedback will help inform the draft of the, the renewal. We asked the following high-level questions and received some really great input from a number of organizations as well as individuals. So if any of you on the, uh, the other end of this uh, call here uh, provided feedback, I, I thank you. We don't anticipate that the renewal will provide a significant shift to the fundamental way that we tackle invasive species in the province. A focus on prevention, detection, and response is expected to remain the foundation of our approach. However, as we consider the future state of invasive species, prevention and management, uh, we want to continue to hear from you. We want to identify and, where possible, seize opportunities, reduce barriers, and ultimately maximize the effectiveness of our efforts. We're considering the feedback that we've already received. And additionally, we're considering feedback through other jurisdictions, uh, through conversations uh, and meetings. And uh, we're preparing a draft that will be available on the ERO in the coming months. 
as with the nature of our business, we're taking a collaborative approach to uh, inform the region. And while we, the MNRF, are leading the project, we're working with many partners as well as partner ministers who share our responsibility in, um, in managing invasive species. In addition, we're also engaging our federal counterparts uh, and we're meeting with and having conversations with interested Indigenous communities and organizations. These conversations are going to help augment the information received or sought out uh, through the ERO. By using this collaborative approach, the renewed OISIP will reflect the diversity of our province and the complexity of the issue of these species. And then finally, just as uh, a recap in, in next steps, uh, the OISIP review, so I'm using OISIP, that means Ontario Invasive Species Strategic Plan, uh, if that confused anybody. Uh, the OISIP review of progress has already been completed uh, and is published. Uh, so I would recommend, if you're interested, finding it on the website, uh, or I can paste the a link to it uh, in the QA following my chat. Uh, for the renewal, we've been initiated our early engagement. We're considering the feedback that we've received and uh, we've heard from you through that process. We're working cl closely across government agencies to provide clarification on roles and responsibilities related to invasive species prevention and management. And that gap was highlighted uh, quite clearly in, uh, in the review and uh, the feedback we received. Uh, so we're actively working to address that in the uh, renewed OISIP. Once completed, the OISIP draft will be available for input on the ERO, as I mentioned, it's expected in the, in the coming months. Um, and I encourage you to read the proposal as well as provide uh, continued feedback. Uh, so we value your insights and your, your inputs. And then finally, once uh, we receive that input, a final uh, a document will be published uh, on the ERO. It is available through our website. And that's it. I hope I have time for questions, though I might have got rid of my question period in my fumbling at the start. No problem. Thanks, Matt. I really appreciate it. It's great to see uh, some updates, and we were really happy to see those uh, uh, new additions to the ISA this year. That was uh, a really great thing. So. Um, we will, I think if it's okay with you, Matt, we'll just move on to the next speaker just because we are a little delayed. Um, but do you mind answering any questions that come in through the chat and uh, we can go from there? All right. Uh, sorry, did you want me to type in the chat so you can continue? Is that what you're asking? I'm getting a, a an echo in addition to all the other problems. I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry to hear that. Yeah, if you don't mind, um, if anything comes through uh, in the chat, if you don't mind answering that there. That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and our next speaker, uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Brittany Day from the CFIA. So um, I'll pass it to you, Brittany. All right. Thank you, Jenna. And I hope you can hear me loud and clear. I'm uh, in a different location compared to usual, and I'm going to try and jump around between presentation mode and demoing some of the tools. So my fingers are tightly crossed that everything goes according to plan. Um, I'll go ahead and pull up the presentation. I guess I should share my screen first. Right. And I hope you can see the full slide. Uh, right now it's in just PowerPoint um, mode. maybe that top bar yeah there we go perfect okay great thanks all right so hello everyone good afternoon my name is Brittany day and i am the national manager of the plant research and strategies team at the canadian food inspection agency i'm here today to present uh, an overview and a sneak peek of the canadian plant health information system or what we call cfis for short it's uh, an information sharing platform that's being developed at cfia but in collaboration with many other partners um, and so yeah today i'll give you a quick walkthrough of some of the tools and give some information on if you're interested in becoming a member, how to go about that. 
Uh, before actually getting into the tools themselves, it's important, I think, to, to give an overview as to why we need CFIS. And so one of the driving forces behind this initiative has been CFIA's increasing desire to increase focus on prevention. And so I thought this was a, a good visual to include on this slide. It, it would resonate well with this audience as it's an invasion curve that was developed by the Invasive Species Centre pulled from their website. And really the message is pretty simple, but I think what it's, uh, what it's showing is, is quite considerable in that uh, prevention is really where we need to focus efforts if we wanna save money and efforts and resources in the long run. So if we're able to prevent that next invasive pest emergency, we're going to sell, save ourselves a lot of time, effort, money, and everything in the long-term long control of that new species. And so one of the key ways to doing that is really through having more access to information and collectively collaborating on problems that uh, we're all trying to work on together. And so some of the drivers for this, uh, this information sharing system are that we are all developing, generating a lot of great data sets, but a lot of them are currently dispersed across different organizations. And so if there is a way to kind of consolidate and, and bring those data sets together, that, that could lead to more informed analyses and better decision making. In some cases, there could be duplication of efforts happening across organizations, perhaps in the research world or perhaps uh, in surveillance, looking for common species. So having a system in order to share data sets and know what's going on within the, the greater landscape could also help maximize those resources. And so ultimately what we're trying to do with CFIS is provide an IT solution to achieve those, um, those aspects. And, and these types of platforms exist in other areas. We have one in the food safety realm. There's one for public health, human health, but it seems to remain a gap for plant protection efforts. And so that's really the vision for CFIS. And so CFIS, it's supposed to connect the dots, really. It's a, it's a cloud environment for CFIAM partners to improve collaboration and information sharing from some of those commonly performed activities. So as I mentioned earlier, research could be an example, lab diagnostics, surveillance, horizon scanning and modeling. Those are all activities that different organizations could be performing, but perhaps there's a way to bring it all together and make sure we're getting the most value of, out of that information. And so CFIS will offer a variety of tool sets. Those are going to offer access to those nationally consolidated data sets. There are some different tools also to offer expertise mapping functionality, file sharing, and different analytics products so that we can better assess those known and emerging pest threats. And so the vision is for it to be a platform not only to to support existing collaborations, but also to build new partnerships. So with a growing network of users, there might be opportunities to identify different partners from government or academia, nonprofit or private organizations. So basically a very wide variety of organizations could be using CFIS for their information sharing purposes. And so in order to develop a platform that would be of value and be able to meet the needs of quite a variety user network, we have been doing quite a bit of stakeholder engagement over the course of the CFIS development. Uh, in the early days of its development, when we launched in 2021, to the project to develop the platform, uh, we initiated a CFIS steering committee with a good representation from federal, provincial, academic, and industry groups in order to help with the oversight of that system system to design, its implementation, and, and growth. And so you can see here some of the organizations that have been involved in that steering committee. Uh, we still have a, a good representation from federal. We ourselves, of course, at CFIA, we have Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, as well as the Canadian Forest Service. Uh, a good representation from the provinces as well in BC, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, and Nova Scotia. We've had a couple of academic representatives that have had to come and go due to different reasons. So we are currently looking for an academic replacement. We've sent a few invitations out. We're waiting to hear back if we have any academics in the audience today who are interested in becoming a representative. I'd, I'd certainly welcome an email to, to continue the conversation. Uh, and we also have an industry rep from the Canola Council of Canada who's helping with some of those uh, strategic decisions for CFIS. In addition to our steering committee, we've also been engaging with the Canadian Plant Health Council working groups over the course of the project. They were early endorsers of the platform to, to help with their information sharing needs. And so we've been doing a lot of early engagement. We've involved those groups also in some of the pilot testing, and we're now exploring some soft launch opportunities of the tools with that working group. 
This is our timeline outlining our kind of phased approach to launch in 2024. So the goal is for the first phase of CFIS to launch in March. So it's coming up very soon. Um, you'll see some of the tools that are outlined here, but basically the first sets of tools that are going to be ready to release in phase one would be the registration. So the onboarding of users, our collaboration space, environmental scanning tool and expertise mapping. So I'll, I'll demo those in just a minute. Um, then leading into the fall timeframe, September, there are going to be MOUs developed to support some of the information sharing that we're hoping to achieve in the integrated data portion. So that'll be the second kind of phase of release coming later in the year. And then beyond that, we'll be looking to expand the tool sets um, and offerings within CFIS. So once we have that kind of that stable foundational structure of users and tools established, we'll be looking to grow the platform and, and, and think of some new tools that could be offered. Um, initially, we will begin with some of our steering committee organizations and that Canadian Plant Health Council working group to bring them on board, but then looking to expand to other organizations in the future. Okay, I think this is where I was going to try and demo some of the tools, so I hope this works. <laughs> Are you still able to see my screen? Yeah, we can see your uh, benefits to CFIS members is, is what we oh, thought. Still there. Okay, we'll try this then. I'm just going to share my screen. Let me know if it switches over. Yeah, still just currently on the slide deck, but it could be a bit slow and <laughs> registering. There yeah. it is. Yep. It's coming. Okay, good. I see a spinning wheel. So I'm happy I, I preloaded some of the, <laughs> the windows for that reason. Um, so basically when you when you come onto the CFIS platform as a registered user, this is what you're going to see. This is the landing page. And so there are the kind of four key tools that'll be housed within this platform. Um, so there's integrated data, as mentioned, that'll be released a little further down this year once we have MOUs established, but I'll walk through that in a moment. Um, but maybe first I'll start with the expertise mapping. Hoping I can maybe move this toolbar. Uh, apologies. Okay. There we go. Hope that's showing expertise mapping. Um, so basically, once you click on that tile, you'll be brought to this page. It's a, it's powered through a Power BI dashboard. So that's a Microsoft product. And basically what it will allow is CFIS users to um, enter information about the facility or organization that they work at and be able to outline the expertise that is offered at your organization. So it's a really nice interactive tool. You can zoom in and out. You can hover over and, and click on a, a facility to get the information. But what's great about it as well is that it does offer an option to filter. So if you're perhaps working on a project, you're looking for some bioinformatics expertise, if it loads, there we are. So you can click on different areas of expertise. You can see here some of the other things that you can filter on too. Uh, there's information on proficiency testing, ISO accreditation, different types of activities. So basically it allows you to filter then and see um, what facilities across the country might be specialists in that kind of area. And so there on the right, you can click on the facility that then is filtered out and get some more information such as the location, a primary contact, perhaps you want to know a bit more about what types of bioinformatics expertise is offered. So basically just a good tool that if you're ever looking for perhaps a new collaborator or a service provider of some kind, this could be a nice tool in, in order to locate that type of um, information from the CFIS network. The next tool I'll demo is the environmental scanning tool. And I'm just gonna jump right into it to save everyone some dizziness. <laughs> So this is what the environmental scanning tool looks like. And what it is, is an, it's a tool that offers users the option to search for keywords. So you can type in a keyword um, using the query function. And basically it scours the internet. So thousands of different websites for um, articles or web pages or news releases on that topic of interest. 
And so again, it's a very interactive tool. You can scroll in and out. Um, these dots would be showing you different locations of, um, so for example, if you typed in a keyword, wherever that word is popping up across the world, that's what these uh, dots here represent. So you can scroll in. And then if there is an article of interest, I'm not sure what's here, but um, it would basically allow you to, to zoom in and get more information about that article. So down below it would, uh, for example, there could be different articles here. I wasn't able to, to do a quick search on something of, of a specific topic. So there's probably quite a mix here, but I'll just click on this one. For example, a new herbicide, a boon for Durham wheat crop um, was published in the stock journal. And so here you can then see um, the abstract or the text. And basically, if this was of interest to, to groups within the CFIS network, there is an option to share that with others to bring that to their attention, um, options to highlight different sections. And so it's just a really neat tool to see what's going on out in the world on a topic of interest and make that information available to others if you're doing any science scanning or kind of horizon scanning for things that might be coming. Uh, right. The next one. Oh, right. Go back. The next one is collaboration space. So what this is, is basically MS Teams. And so I'm sure many people here are familiar with what MS Teams is. Um, but the nice thing about Teams and the CFIS platform is that it does allow you, sorry, the internet here is just a little slow to keep up with me today. <laughs> um, it's a, it brings everyone in the CFIS network into one spot. So if you wanted to instant message or if you wanted to upload and save files, say you're working in a working group and rather than having you know presentations or spreadsheets kind of scattered on various computers or servers, you could all upload your information into the MS Teams space and have a separate private channel for things like uh, communities of practice or file sharing, that kind of activity. And it does give you the option to instant message instantly and also so within files, you can simultaneously work on them together. So there is an option to open up a document and two people at two different organizations could be editing the document at the same time. So some basic features, but the fact that it brings a variety of organizations into one kind of MS team space is, is one of the nice offerings there. And then just lastly, I'll show um, the integrated data tools. Um, this is basically the page that you would be brought to, and there's kind of a variety of tools that are envisioned for integrated data. Um, partners will be able to upload data sets on test presence absence, and so there's a variety of tools then to, able, to enable visualization of that data. So Power BI dashboards, kind of similar to what I demonstrated with expertise mapping. You could visualize it, um, add filters, do some trending. And then one other kind of more advanced tool um, that I'll just quickly pull up is something like a risk map. So if you were interested in looking at, say, different risk pathways for spotted lanternfly, as an example, there could be some filters added for kind of what the where those exports are coming from, the key ports of entry, and some um, commonly traveled routes, for example, just to then um, get a sense of maybe where you want to target surveys, for example. It's not letting me then click in. And again, it's an interactive map, so everything updates as you click on things. All right, we'll see if I'm, I'm trying to scroll in. <laughs> but it gives you a sense, basically, this is uh, those red, dark red lines might be where you would like to target your surveillance efforts, knowing that those are some of the most commonly uh, trafficked pathways for lumber exports from the US to Canada, for example. All right, I'm looking at the time. I know I have a couple more slides left, so I'm going to pull those back up. And so just to highlight some of the benefits of becoming a, a CFIS member would be that this is a collaborative online environment for a variety of organizations. So sometimes these platforms exist, but it might only be for government or it might only be for non-government. The beauty is that it really brings everyone into one kind of central platform for collaborating. Uh, the idea is to have modernized information sharing, file storage, and communication channels. As a user, you also get free access to that licensed software, so those Microsoft products. So it's, there's no cost to join, and then you get access to all these really cool tools. 
And then, of course, the benefit of having access to comprehensive data sets and data collections in order to do a more kind of in-depth analysis and, and being able to observe trends over time and also to link up with common, you know, common expertise or those working in the field to, to take a look at these kind of risk intelligence products collectively. In addition, because we're just about to launch CFIS, one of the great things of becoming kind of a, a preliminary member is the ability to then kind of inform where we go from here. So when we want to look at adding new tools on or making system enhancements, kind of the coming on board early kind of gives you that foot in the door in order to help us continue to build the platform into something really fantastic over the next couple of years. And so if you are interested in becoming a member, I've just outlined a couple of steps. So the email address here on the screen is uh, just a generic email address that goes to the teams running CFIS at CFIA. So you could reach out, uh, we can provide some information, including um, uh, user guides and different kind of informational products if you'd like to know more before actually signing up. Um, if you are interested, if your organization would like to become a member, there are some steps involved as well. So we would have a meeting and we would kind of go over the different roles that need to be assigned within the system and such as like a data steward or um, someone who's going to help with the registrations at your organization. So there are some bits of role and assignment to, to become a member and we would walk you through that. And then if you are interested in that integrated data portion, there is an MOU that would have to be signed off in order to gain access to that part of the system. And we will be offering more training and demos, a bit more in depth than to each of those tools I gave you a quick sneak peek at today. Um, so those will be coming soon. We'll be offering those to CFIA staffers, but then doing a lot more outreach externally in, in the coming months as well. So that's it. And I hope I'm not too much over time, but I've left my email address here at the bottom too. If there are any questions after the today's forum, I'm happy to answer them and um, feel free to reach out to that email address. If you're interested in registering for CFIS too, I'd know where to direct you as well. So. Thanks, Brittany. No, that was great. Uh, it's great to hear about that tool. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's really timely. Good, good thing to have. And, and also we appreciate your time today because the launch is coming up and you must be pretty busy. So uh, we really appreciate you being here. Um, I think if you don't mind, we're going to also maybe just move on just to stay on time. Um, but if you don't mind uh, monitoring the chat and letting, you know, anybody know who has any questions about where they can go, that would be really great. Sure thing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brittany. All righty. Uh, so we'll move on to our uh, next speaker, Joseph Stinziano. Um, so I'll pass it to you. Um, I think we'll just get going if you don't mind, so we can stay on time. Okay. Thank you, Jenna. Um, can you hear me and see my screen? Everything looks great. Yep. Perfect. Hi, everyone. My name is Joseph Stinziano. I'm a science authority that leads the Plant Health Analytics Hub at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And today I'll be talking about a species distribution model that me and my team have been working on um, for assessing climate suitability of invasive species. And today we'll be looking at a test case of this model for trying to predict North American invasions. You might ask, what are species distribution models? What is species distribution modeling? They try to identify where a species could be or has the potential to be present. There's process-based models, which use biological variables such as uh, cold tolerance limits, heat tolerance limits, and so on, as well as climate data to predict these potential distributions. A good example with a solid track record is that of climates. There are also correlative models, which use climate variable correlations between where a species is present to try and predict where it could exist and survive. And a commonly used one that you may have seen before is max ent. Now the model that I'll be presenting is a correlative model, um, but it works a little bit differently. You might also ask why bother modeling species distributions? Well, for invasive pests, they can provide us with advanced warning, um, information for planning surveillance, as well as survey method design. They can support risk assessment in determining whether a potential pest should be regulated or not, and they can help us focus resources. All of this to support that idea of early detection and rapid response. Now, a lot of species distribution models use a more Euclidean calculation. So trying to calculate, um, if you can imagine a straight line distance between its home range climate and the climate you're trying to project to. So in these hypothetical plots, we have two climate variables, X and Y, 
and our observed species present points along this climate gradient are in blue. A Euclidean distance draws basically a straight line from the middle of that climate space and draws a circle um, to try and predict the climate suitable area. This is an oversimplification of many of the models, but this is essentially what many of them do. And this green space in this plot represents the climate suitable area as determined by that type of calculation. And you'll notice there's a lot of space here where the species just doesn't exist because that combination of climate variables would be something it hasn't experienced before. Now, there's another approach for calculating these climate envelopes called Mahalanobis distance. And what this does is it accounts for the fact that climate variables tend to co-vary and species might be able to say tolerate hot and wet conditions or dry and cold conditions, but they might not be able to tolerate hot, dry conditions or cold, wet conditions. And when we use this approach to try and calculate the climate envelope, we get something that's much tighter around the observed species distribution. And so this should be better at predicting species distributions and climate suitability. Now, the method that I'm taking was originally designed as a diagnostic tool for species distribution models. And so I'm going to use some of the terminology that the authors of that paper used. And they really phrased climate suitability in terms of type one and type two novelty. So type one novelty are climatic conditions that are outside of the observed species climate envelope. So say if a species has a lower lethal temperature limit of minus 10, any climate where the temperature drop below minus 10 would be a type one novel environment. Type two novelty, it's a little bit more complex. So we have say two different climate conditions with upper and lower bounds. And a type two novel area would be something that's still within the maximum minimum of each climate variable, but it's a new combination for the species. And so it hasn't been observed in that combination of climate variables, even though it could theoretically be possible. And to illustrate this, I have this plot here. It's a simple square where the red area is type one novelty in the climate space. The blue area is the type two novelty and the yellow area is the climate suitable area. So type two novelty could be climate suitable with some level of acclimation or adaptation. Now this approach, there's a lot of equations that go in here. I'm just showing them for due diligence. Feel free to ignore the equations, but the Mahalanobis distance accounts for how those climate variables co-vary. Typically, if you want to model species distributions, you want to reduce your climate variables so you don't have any autocorrelation between the climate variables because then you can have issues with the actual modeling projection. But this approach takes advantage of those autocorrelations and so is more powerful by including more climate variables. It also allows for this most important covariate analysis where we can run the model with and without different climate variables to see which one has the biggest impact on the predictions for the species distribution model. This can allow us to look at a model output and determine whether or not we should include or exclude a variable if it doesn't make sense to. For the overall workflow, this model requires two types of data, climate data and then species presence data. For the climate data, we reduced the overall resolution and selected a variable set based on the advice of our risk assessors and used that information to then calculate climate origin reference variables. And if you're looking for a good source of climate data and have been having trouble finding it, uh, the Chelsea data set, if you just Google it, it's a really good resource for getting uh, different climate norms. And then for the occurrence data, we used uh, GBIF data as well as CFIA data. We cleaned that and split it into a training data set and a test data set. The training data set were all the observations for a species that were outside of North America. And the test data set was all the observations that were within North America. And from there, we calculated a climate suitability projection for North America and then tested to see if the test data points were within the climate suitable range of the overall model. And in some cases, we engaged in a variable reduction process to take away a couple variables. 
So the species inclusion criteria for this study were that the species had to be a CFI regulated pest and that the observations when converted into pixels in a spatial raster. So you can imagine a map that's um, composed of pixels that lined up with the climate data. We need at least 10 pixels per climate variable that we used, and we used 13 or 14 climate variables depending on the specific pest. And so to illustrate that a little bit more simply, let's just say we have this grid, a three by three grid, that's our map, and we have 13 observation points, but they're clustered. In this case, these 13 points would become three pixels of observation in our actual modeling. For the species occurrence data, we eliminated any observations that had high coordinate uncertainty or other problems with them and points that were within bodies of water as we, those were deemed to be inaccurate. And we used a set of bioclimatic variables. I'm happy to talk about these later. Um, these are just a short forms, but in short, we used a combination of temperature and precipitation related variables for the actual modeling. And it differed a little bit between whether the species was a plant or an insect. <clears throat> For that most important covariate reduction process that I briefly mentioned, um, we looked at a couple species that had relatively low accuracy and removed the most important covariate contributing to those inaccurate predictions until the accuracy exceeded about 80% for the North American invasion. For the overall model performance, it performed quite well across most species, getting an 87.5% <clears throat> accuracy in that multivariate capacity in the climate suitable prediction. Um, in that type two novelty or univariate area, it achieved an accuracy of about 94%, but there were two problem species, uh, spotted lanternfly and Japanese stilt grass. So we're gonna focus in on those. And those are the two species where we ran through a variable selection process and we're able to get the model performance to jump up to 97.8 and 100% just by removing a couple variables from the actual model. So what does this all look like? For spotted lanternfly, this was the initial model run with uh, 14 variables. <clears throat> and this species distribution model creates these novelty plots. So as I mentioned earlier, type one novel, which is shown in red here, are environments that are completely outside of the observed climate for where the species comes from. So anything outside of North America, the type one novel environments mean that species wasn't found in a similar environment. <clears throat> in blue are the type two novel predictions. So that would be theoretically climate suitable for the species, but it wasn't observed in its home climate. And the yellow is the actual climate suitable area. On these maps, we have little black dots with a buffer zone indicating points that were considered type one novel. And you'll see here <clears throat> in this first pass map that there's a lot of blue in that core range of spotted lanternfly in the North American invasion. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. On the right-hand side is the most important covariate estimation. Um, so it's just showing which variables were driving the overall predictions and climate suitability. Now, if we <clears throat> remove the climate variables that were associated with incorrect predictions, we can draw up a new climate suitability map on the left. The old one I just shown was on the right. And we can see that core range where spotted lanternfly is found is then deemed climate suitable. We removed a couple precipitation variables that just didn't make sense based on um, the species biology. And again, this isn't including the North American um, points in the actual model projection. It's just simply testing the model against the North American points. So this is pretty promising that as a model that can predict potential climate suitability. Now for Japanese stiltgrass, this one had quite a few additional erroneous points. We can see a lot more black dots here and the climate suitability region here. Um, and the climate suitable area tends to surround that type two novel area, that area that might require acclimation or adaptation. And so if we do a variable reduction process and get an updated map, 
we can see that it really changes the overall climate suitable area and expands it into one contiguous area. Now, there were some limitations when we were testing this. We were hoping to test it on plant pathogens, but we found generally they don't have enough occurrence data to do the species distribution modeling, at least according to the criteria we had for this study. As well for this particular approach, fewer observations will underestimate climate suitability. It'll constrain the estimated climate envelope. And with respect to data sources, we're currently using mostly GBIF data, which pulls research grade observations from iNaturalist. And there are known issues with iNaturalist data quality. And we did have to remove quite a few observations for a couple plant species due to inaccurate identifications. And then again, just on that plant pathogen aspect, there are some data sources, but they're a lot more diverse and unlinked and don't have the same level of detail for assessing data quality as the GBIF data has. And so some key takeaways, this model, which uses a standardized Mahalanobis distance, can accurately identify where invasions can occur in North America. So we're hoping to use this going forward. The estimates are constrained by the observed climate niche, so it could underestimate potential suitability. So it's less suitable for species where we have very few observations. And I'd like to make a point of saying that these climate suitability maps that my team is developing, we're planning to make them available through the Canadian Plant Health Information System. Um, so if there are any particular species that you might want a climate suitability map for, um, feel free to toss them in the chat, especially if you're planning to become a part of CFIS, um, because we might be able to have them ready by the time you might join. Um, and with that, I'd just like to acknowledge André Charon and Martin Damis, who helped put this work together. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. That was great. Um, I think uh, I think you made that a very accessible presentation for everybody. It was uh, great to see the data communicated that way. Although that one formula was pretty daunting. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks like uh, we do have a quick question here. Um, so with uh, correlative approaches, is there an underlying assumption that the native range is determined by abiotic climate con climate climatic conditions and ignores biotic interactions that limit distributions in the native range? How do you account for this difference? So I think in this particular instance um, that those type two novel conditions that I mentioned could represent areas where the species might have been biotically limited in its home range. So we could imagine it can't hit that same combination of say temperature and precipitation its home range because of competition, but because it's theoretically possible, it invades that range in the North American distribution. That said, um, I'd be open to having discussion on how better to account for that. I, I feel like the method already does to some extent, except if the climate envelope it's excluded from through competition is outside of the observed actual limits of, of each climate variable. Great, thank you. That's a that's a tough one. Um, so uh, our next question is: How does this climate suitability model compare to climate similarity modeling uses a using a climate climatched algorithm? Sorry, that's a mouthful. Um, so this climate suitability model provides some more objective limits on what's considered climate suitable. So that um, what I showed in the maps is the yellow range was considered climate suitable, and that type two novelty would be the range where you're starting to extrapolate. With Climatch, you're left to guess at some sort of a cutoff threshold to say this is climate suitable and this isn't. So it removes some of that subjectivity and guesswork. Um, and it does also provide a more constrained climate envelope potentially. Um, but I do wanna work on comparing the projections from this model with the other existing species distribution models. So we have that in the pipeline, um, but we haven't run that comparison yet. Um, but that's a good question, thanks. Yeah, wonderful, thanks. So that looks like, oh, oh we've got one more, um, just briefly, sorry, Maddie. <laughs> um, as well, many invasives can be highly uh, plastic and express extreme plasticity when exposed to new climatic conditions i.e. emerald ash borer surviving in Winnipeg. How does this method, how does this method work for this type of situation? So this method is limited by the 
climate where the species has been observed. So if what I showed was just a test of the actual method. We would include the North American observation points in an um, actual realistic um, model. But if, say, emerald ash borer hadn't ever been found in any conditions resembling Winnipeg, Manitoba, it wouldn't be able to predict that. It's, it's constrained by the fact that it's a correlative model. In that case, for a species like that, you might want to use something process-based like Pimex, um, although it can be hard to get the information. Um, so again, it's correlative, so it's constrained by the observed correlations and its predictions. All righty. Um, we have one more question. Um, I'm just going to read it quickly, Maddie, if that's okay with you. Oh, yeah. All good. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Um, interesting approach. Aquatic species may be more difficult to model um, because climate data is not necessarily tied to water environments. So that's kind of a question and, and common all into one. Uh, yeah. Um, I'd be happy to chat about that. The data sources for applying this kind of a model would be challenging to get, and you'd need to get them at quite a high resolution. Um, so you'd also potentially be computation limited, but I'd be happy to chat about that and potentially help out, especially for things like aquatic invasive plants, for example. Thank you. Wonderful. And I think your contact information is in the chat there. So if anybody did want to follow up, um, should be able to do so. Thanks so much, Joseph. And uh, I can pass it back to you, Maddie. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jenna. And thanks to all our really wonderful speakers for taking the time to share your tools and updates. We really appreciate your time. We're going to take a short little break here and meet back at 345 for part two of our monitoring policy and innovation session. So just a little bit of time just to refill your coffee, grab a glass of